game, which could, of course, mean anything. Uh, hats off to whoever came up with that title. Um, I would like to introduce, uh, on my immediate left, uh, Emily Fragapani, the Senior Analyst for Performance Science with the Dodgers. Dr. Lee Piccarello, the owner and operator of Mindful Athlete Training. And, I'm sorry, I got it mixed up. Lee's down there on the end. And, uh, and Julian Volan, the co-founder and chief of product for Trinity uh, VR. Um, and I'd like to just jump uh, straight in. Um, uh, I was, um, uh, I'm a little out of my element um, with, with this, uh, this subject, so I asked uh, some friends for help. And uh, uh, Ben Lindbergh, who has a, a book coming out in June, um, called with uh, Travis Sochik called The MVP Machine. Um, he was kind enough to send me a few excerpts and I wanted to uh, quote one of those. Um, this is John Baker who is the coordinator of the Cubs Mental Skills Program. Uh, and this really dovetails quite a bit with the things we've been talking about earlier um, in the conference with technology, but uh, the, the great thing about this panel is we're able to sort of go beyond some of the the things that we've been talking about. Uh, so this is John Baker. You think about things like spin rate and exit velocity and how they're changing um, how we view baseball. Well, those things are effective because they have science behind them. A and that opens the door to other things that have science behind them. Things like mindfulness or meditation practice or what I'm trained in now, which is mindfulness-based attention training. So um, Emily, could you talk a little bit about, about some of these sort of not spin rate and uh, launch angle, but some of the other things that, that um, the Dodgers are looking into these days. Yeah, so I think that obviously, you know, a lot of teams are looking at kind of those types of metrics, but with the Dodgers, we are trying to make a lot of these things more applicable. So with all of the data-based uh, technologies and things like that, and um, particularly in practice settings and trying to apply those to in-game skills. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously a ton of t uh, technology out there, StatCast at the major league level, and then you know, we have like Rapsodo and things like that at the minor league level. You know, Edutronic has been big. Um, just trying to figure out how to make those things applicable to the players and to the coaches. You know, to try to take it from being a front office thing used to trade and cut guys <laughs> and try to make it more accessible for players. You know, how do we develop you? How do we make you better? How do we bring this to a place where we can utilize it to, you know, increase your stock? Because obviously the front office wants you to succeed because it has money invested in you and you want to succeed because it's your career and trying to make those things, bring those things closer together. And Emily, I want to get back a little bit later to how you interact with the coaches, but uh, Julian, could you talk, uh, maybe give us your elevator pitch on, on what you're doing right now? Yeah, so at Trinity VR, we are trying to uh, build a platform to train those perceptual cognitive skills. So there's a, a problem right now in, in being able to train on some of these decision-making skills and then applying that to um, and correlating that to on-field transfer. Um, so what we do at Trinity VR is we offer a platform for you to test different perceptual cognitive skills and decision making around pitch type identification, area identification, strike identification. We expose all these metrics within our platform so that you can get a holistic view as a sports scientist or an analyst of what, what are your benchmarks and norms within your organization. And then, you know, how do you, and then you can design a program around those benchmarks to then drive improvement. So it's testing and, and training within Diamond FX. And Lee, uh, uh, that word holistic comes up quite a bit in my research uh, for this panel. Uh, could you talk about what you do for, for, for a bit? Well, Mindful Athlete Training, uh, we developed a holistic metric uh, that we feel is the best representation of an athlete's entire integration of systems. So we look at the heart, we look at the brain, we look at muscles and the nervous system. To speak to uh, your original uh, comment from the gentleman from the Cubs, mindfulness is a very uh, abstract concept. Uh, there is more and more science that is supporting how it literally changes brain anatomy uh, after extensive training, mindfully based meditation practices. But I think the key thing to understand is that mindfulness, uh, simply defined, is paying attention on purpose, in the moment, without judgment. Um, that's the objective. 
The hard part is that you can teach athletes to breathe diaphragmatically. You can teach them to engage in mindfulness-based meditation practices. But if you're not quantifying their progress, the game within the game that's being so dramatically driven by numbers, you're not going to hold the retention of the athletes. You're not going to get buy-in. And I think what we do at Mindful Athlete Training, when we were here last year, uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to listen to a director of player development panel with Annie McKay and Chris Getz. And we actually posed one of the questions, what would the value of a mental skill metric be? And the answer was, it would be invaluable, but we're not quite sure that that can be developed. So we went to work. And when we look at the four different types of the key domains of human performance, let's just make something clear, folks. This is not necessarily a baseball-related objective. This is a human performance objective. And I can't emphasize that enough. Because if you think about any individual's ability to integrate systems. What I'm doing right now requires a fair amount of integration. This is my game day, and I just got a 93-mile-an-hour slider. So now I have to adjust in the moment, and it's all about the attentional shifts that an athlete goes through, and we feel that we have now been able to quantify an athlete's ability to engage in that shifting process over time. And let's talk, we'll talk about those metrics a little later. Um, Emily, uh, I, one of the things that we've seen, um, and this is highly relevant to people in this room, is uh, a great number of what we might have called, maybe still call hobbyists or amateurs, have been hired away from various websites and um, to work on the analytics departments. Um, but uh, there's probably not as as uh, the great as great a wellspring of talent in the sports science area, how do you find and cultivate people with the uh, the necessary skills and and interest in baseball, given how little uh, probably correlation there is between those two things? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, you're right. I think that it's just generally a smaller subset of people who have those overlapping interests. Uh, I do think that there is a lot of overlap in the sense that. A lot of people, like, the body is the body, right? And so if you are understanding and you're interested in the, the mental skills applications, if you're interested in understanding how the body works and things like that, which is kind of, you know, the sports science realm, um, I think that you find good people who are talented and interested in, in that type of uh, topic, and there is a decent overlap, but again, it, it's trying to find, you know, the network for those people and the, you know, resources to, you know, seek, you have to seek those people out, right? They might not necessarily be planning on a career in baseball, but, you know, between basketball, football, especially um, European football, like, there's a lot of overlap in the sports realm with that type of information, and so finding those people and then, you know, bringing them into the baseball fold is definitely, you know, a, a huge source of talent. Lee and Julian, you must be facing the same issues when you're looking to hire people. Yeah, so I, I come from a, a less conventional baseball background. I've been in games, game analytics, and, and financial technology for the past decade. And I've been able to cultivate a team of, an innovative team of, of folks that have, you know, game development experience, um, uh, game analytics experience. Uh, there's a lot of ap applicability and uh, correlation to the skills that you need to succeed in designing uh, data-driven gaming, uh, as there is to designing a simulation that's that's both accurate and and valuable to a player. So, kind of looking in areas that you know don't necessarily have the you know maybe the the, the baseball background, but have you know a technology and innovation and, and an analytics background. Um, and the fact that we're working with an exciting new platform, the virtual reality, just makes it that much easier to, to attract talent that wants to do something interesting and, and valuable. Well, I think from a, a clinical psychology standpoint, uh, you know, traditional mental skills is pretty much the hallmark of peak performance. And when you think about that, you're not really looking at any model without mentioning the, the relevance of things when you hear mental skills talk of guided imagery or visualization or um, inner dialogue or goal setting. But for, as far as we're concerned at Mindful Athlete Training, um, we are all clinical psychologists with specification in sport performance and specifically biofeedback training. 
uh, which is really the value of real-time information. And this kind of circles back to the mindfulness comment uh, from the Cubs of what we started our conversation with. How do we quantify mindfulness? And the answer is we break it down into individual pieces and it allows us to have a better understanding of what the human body is doing in real time. And the only way, in my opinion, that mental skills continues to make more of a significant impact in sports like baseball is you holistically have to integrate it with physical skill training because that's where you get the player buy-in. If you come to me and I'm a personal trainer and you want to lose 20 pounds, the first thing I'm going to have you do is put you on a scale. I'm going to give you a baseline, but we don't do that in mental skills. We teach athletes to put themselves in a particular place of relaxation, but if we're not tracking it, we can't train for it. Uh, I want to shift uh, to something that I spoke about on uh, the panel I was actually on uh, on Friday, and that's how uh, re regards how it seems that the pitchers are ahead of the hitters these days in terms of various training tools and and the ability to improve and shape pitches and all those things. Um, and uh, I have a quote from from again the book The MVP Machine, uh, Brian Bannister. Uh, says, it doesn't matter if you turn up the velocity. This is about pitching machines. Um, it doesn't matter if you turn up the velocity. The spin rate is the same. So you never actually, as a hitter, have any way to practice against really, really elite spin rate pitchers. Um, and this is obviously in your wheelhouse. Uh, uh, Ju uh, Julian, could you talk a little bit about how your tool is able to maybe uh, give the, the hitters a shot against these, these pitchers who are doing all these incredible things? Yeah, so we, we're definitely trying to level the playing field and we're taking advantage of all the data that's already been collected via pitch effects and, and track man and we are able to visualize that data within our simulation so we're able to model those pitches accurately um, down to, um, you know, within the 95th percentile of accuracy on some of these pitches. So, you know, you're able to see the accurate pitch within the simulation as a batter you're able to prepare uh, against, uh, you know, different pitches, pitch types, different pitchers, and see those pitches one-to-one -one <clears throat> with uh, the, not only the trajectory and the trajectory cues, but also the uh, pitcher phenotype. So you're able to actually see the release. You're able to see the, um, you know, the wind-up and the delivery. So these are tools now that, you know, give perceptual cognitive skills back to the batter to train and, and do game prep. So I think it's a pretty powerful technology. Lee? Yeah, um, I think I can't speak to the, 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 the technical aspect of what Julian just sp spoke to. I mean, uh, that system out there is, is nothing short of amazing. Um, but when I hear that type of question, the first thing I think about is if pitchers have the advantage and we can't necessarily train uh, in a quantifiable way, what that experience is like for the hitters, then what we need to do is we need to define how that experience makes these athletes feel. And that isn't necessarily talked about in a broad sweeping stroke. It's more about when there's a problem that's being identified. When you think about traditional sports psychology, we are deemed as the medicine men. We're brought in when there's a problem, and that's a problem. Because what it needs to be is it needs to be a level of normalization across the implementation of such skills like mental skills training so that this is simply becomes part of what we do. So how that incredible advantage that a pitcher might have, how it makes the athlete feel, is the attentional demands within the game and the shifting. Um, sometimes when baseball players go up to the plate, they have a very specific game plan. They've scouted the pitcher. They know how that pitcher attacks them. They know exactly how good they are historically, and they have a very specific plan. But if something happens early on that at bat and that plan gets disrupted, how do we simulate that transition? How do we simulate that emotional change that the athlete goes through? And one of the things that we do at Mindful Athlete Training is we overwhelm the senses. We saturate them to the point where an athlete 
the basic aspects of staying calm, being focused, engaging their muscles, and then integrating it with a holistic at bat, they need to overlearn it and rehearse it with, with quantifiable metrics all along the way of to what degree they are actually staying in that optimal space where action and awareness merge and time slows down because that's the flow state. And there's a ton of science on flow state and what exactly goes on with that. But if we can't necessarily take those athletes to that place of gross unfamiliarity, well, I don't care how many reps you get, no disrespect to virtual reality. It's not necessarily about the reps, it's how the reps make you feel. And that's something that we can put our finger on in today's world and we can teach these athletes. So uh, I, I reached out to Gabe Kapler, who had some lovely things to say about working with Emily. Uh, and Gabe actually sent, uh, sent me, was kind enough to send me this question uh, for Emily. Um, you have a math and data background, and you're also drawn to player development. Uh, with many farm systems still having a healthy smattering of um, veteran coaches with playing backgrounds, and maybe less familiarity with data, how do you take data that's interesting to you and make it digestible for coaches? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Cap. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I think that this has been like a huge, huge focus for us uh, in, in the type of information that we have um, to the point, again, of trying to develop guys and to actually make it interesting. Um, so I think once we identify pieces of information or types of technology that we think are interesting and have potential to... Uh, be an applied uh, an applied application for guys. Uh, I think that it's really important for us to try to direct the communication and the delivery to the individual player or the individual coach. So obviously, you know, the, the building relationships with guys to know how they think, what they care about, what they're interested in is, a, you know, one basis. Um, like presenting the same information as a table to one coach, but as a you know line plot to another coach, like that things like little things like that help. Um, I think moreover though, um, you know we're just measuring things that coaches already look at, look at right, and so. Um, you know, I often liken it to, you know, before radar guns, you were looking at VLO, and now radar guns are fully accepted. So how do you just turn the dialogue away from, hey, this is data and you should be interested, and more towards, you're already looking at this, we can make it, you know, more precise, and we can make your job easier, we can make the player's job easier, and kind of just you know, change that dialogue into something that's less threatening and something that is more accessible to them already, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, before I follow up, um, uh, there are note cards in the back for anyone who has questions for the panel. Uh, I encourage uh, any and all. Uh, Julian and, and Lee, could you talk a little bit about what you've learned uh, while you've spoken to people in organizations and maybe coaches about how to, to bridge that gap? Julian? Sure. Yeah, so, you know, definitely mapping all those stakeholders in the organization from who is going to operate the system to who is going to communicate the analytics within the system, is that sports science, is that player development, to who's doing you know, the analytics in, 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 in kind of you know, the back office. And, and you know, what, catering to all those different needs and, and doing that empathy mapping exercise is something that we've taken into consideration when building the platform. We have APIs for, for analysts who just want the raw data. We have uh, you know, bubbled up uh, aggregate KPIs for your coaches who just want to know what's the, what's the average and then, you know, where, where, do, where do these players deviate from that average? And then what do they need to do next to improve? So just thinking about those different layers within the hierarchy of, of you know, data sophistication and building tools so that we can communicate at all different levels and, and provide value at all different levels is something we've, we've taken into consideration. So, so when you say bridging the gap, uh, that's my language because... Um, one of the challenges that we often had, it's, uh, it's a lot of education, but it's also about making it abundantly clear that we are there to complement other systems that are in place. So when you think about the nature of holistic training, um, it's all-encompassing and it's encouraging more of a mindset where you're asked to shift away from the norm. Uh, uh, Brian Kenny wrote a book, Ahead of the Curve, and for any of those of you who've read it, and he talks about uh, breaking free from the herd or the herd mentality when statistics in the face of 
Um, you know, man on first with no one out uh, has a stronger likelihood of scoring a run when needed than man on second with one out. So why do people continue to bunt people over? Because it's an extension of the, the herd mentality. That's a psychological principle of why people continue to do the same things, perhaps in the face of data. Now that's getting more and more challenged. But breaking free from the herd is not for the timid. And that's a Brian Kenny quote. And I think that's why when we met him last year, that really spoke to what we were trying to establish. Mental skills, as it relates to any performance-related task, needs to have something quantifiable behind it because the numbers are the very thing that's going to motivate these highly competitive athletes. But if you normalize that and you encourage what we do with our metric, which we refer to as BioQ, which stands for BioQuotient, it's a merging of the subjective and the objective. So when you think about scouts and you think about the old school mentality of what they're looking for, they're identifying the intangibles within the athlete. The ones that they feel that they're, everyone's seen the, the clip from the movie Moneyball and, and uh, adapt or die. That's what the, the, the message is. It's almost 30 years of baseball experience versus statistics. And that gap is getting bridged shorter and shorter and shorter. But if you can take a subjective and you can bring it in with an objective measure that now represents that subjectivity, well, that's gold. Because now it's about the connection between the two. And it's giving you a platform to have more intense conversations about how mental skills, when they are quantified, is impacting the bottom line. Let's uh, bring this back around to the beginning a little bit. Um, uh, this is actually a question from uh, a front office uh, uh, person who's probably in the audience. Um, Emily, I'll start with you. How do data-driven teams, like the Dodgers and most everybody else these days, identify real insights uh, and sort out, sort those out from non-scientific claims. I'd like you to sort of speak generally about that, and then you two maybe could bring some concrete examples and citing the data that you actually use. Yeah, so speaking generally to that question, um, you know, I'm, every a front office does it differently, right? And every front office thinks they do it best, which that's how it should be. Um, but to the more general, you know, question, I think coming from a data-driven driven background and having people in the front office who, you know, do have rigorous statistical backgrounds and, you know, other mathematical backgrounds, um, being able to be confident in the answers that you're giving and being confident in your methodology. Um, and so, you know, again, just going in to a question or a problem without preconceived notions. Uh, you know, obviously you draw from baseball wisdom, but, you know, being able to go in with a fresh perspective and not necessarily trying to prove a point, um, I think that that helps with the integrity of the research that you do and leads you to better conclusions. The current research that we've been doing is strictly uh, the Division I baseball level. We're mentioned, we are based out of Philadelphia, and a big reason of, of why we've... Uh, visited at Sabre, our journey began in the winter meetings in Orlando a couple of years ago, is to seek out developmental partnership. And why I think that that's relevant is that speaks to the relationship between mental skills and performance. Um, the idea of how we are trying to make better connections for athletes and increasing their awareness, this mindfulness quantified, we'll just call it that. Um, we found that uh, we created a standardized protocol that can increase on base percentage. So when you think about all of the things that happen inside the batter's box, think about the walk-up song. Well, most people can, will suggest that the walk-up song is entertainment-based. A lot of athletes think that it's motivational, that it helps them get in that zone, in that flow state. It reminds them of positive success. Now we can actually do attention control training and look at brainwave activity as it relates to synchronizing it with music. And if you're not in that optimal flow state, the music that you're listening to stops. It just halts, it ceases. So we're increasing the awareness of the athlete in small vacuum type situations, but getting it to the practice fields getting it to greater simulations, because it's all about impacting in between the white lines. That's what baseball is the most interested in. And that's the hurdle with mental skills, no matter what organization you're with, whether you have one person, whether you have an army of them, 
It's in the relationship between those factors. And Lee, what are you measuring specifically? We're measuring heart rate variability, which has been in baseball for a long time. Uh, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. Because if you can teach someone how to regulate heart rhythms in real time, that's still not accounting for the other variables. What I'm being asked to do right now, I always try to provide real-time examples. So, you know, the lights are kind of in my face a little bit. I can't really see everyone's face. And that encourages a tad bit of anticipatory anxiety because I'm a human being. So imagine being in Yankee Stadium. We work with Jeff Manto from the Baltimore Orioles. He often says that it's one nothing before you walk into Yankee Stadium. Well, why is that? It's the environment. We also track brainwave activity. We can look at ratios of how well someone is actually focused in real time. We can measure neuromuscular timing down to the millisecond. There was a presentation yesterday about the timing of hitting, and they were using the metric 417 milliseconds and how pitching was disrupting that timing. Now we can actually measure someone's bat speed and we can see the timing in milliseconds as it relates to an external stimulus and how it's impacting their neural pathways. We can strengthen neural pathways. Think about that for just a second. A neural pathway is how well we process information. And if I can strengthen that neural pathway by constant repetition and thousands of repetitions over time, those neural pathways, like a brand new cognitive superhighway, get much wider. They get smoother, which allows me to process information more consistently. And the fourth measurement that we take is just pure reaction time. So if we can quantify calm, focused, engaged, and integration and put them all together, well, now we have a holistic metric which can organically grow with the athlete from pre-draft analysis through the scouting system all the way up to player readiness. It grows with them. Imagine that for just a second and the impact that that can have. Because the sooner that we get to these athletes, now the normalization of what we do becomes part of their every day. And that stigma of mental skills doesn't necessarily apply because I'm just a hitter, let me hit. And there is philosophy that is consistent with that. Psychologically, we need to respect that. But the more that we integrate science into mental skills, it's just going to impact the bottom line of the players and the organization. Julian? Yeah, so uh, you know, I think at Trinity VR, we, we do view kind of a holistic talent indicator as the holy grail. Um, you know, kind of the, the Google page rank of, of, of player value and um, ability. Uh, there's a long road to get there, uh, especially with virtual reality. You know, it's still early days. We've only had really good uh, consumer headsets for about the, the last two and a half years that are even capable of delivering the refresh rates and the resolution to do these types of drills. So there's still a body of research that needs to be developed to, to validate um, you know, the, the efficacy and the transfer of, of what we do. We've worked with pioneering teams over the past year with, throughout our beta program, already have uh, commercial agreements with those that have conducted their own internal analysis to measure uh, on-field performance and correlation. Um, you know, we, we plan on doing an IRB this year, but it's, it is a road and, um, you know, we're, we're in new territory, so it's, it's going to be a journey. So, uh, just a reminder, uh, if you have any questions for the panel, uh, there are note cards in the back. Uh, I have one more, um, and I'm going to ask you to put on your prognostication caps. Uh, uh, a lot of this, we're talking about what's happening inside the mind, but we're also talking about technology. I know. Um, Lee, you, wearables are a big part of what you do. Yes. Obviously, VR is, is, is technology. Um, Lee, what do you see your world looking like in five years? Wow. Uh, <laughs> a, what's uh, coming? What's coming? Um, a, a mindful athlete training facility in every ballpark in America. Other than that, um, technology, I think, is going to allow the mental skills, the psychology to assist with process of change. And I think that's what we're really talking about up here. It's process of change. And we as human beings go through resistance to change because it's against the norm. Clinically, that's what we call stasis. Stasis gets disrupted. 
when something new is brought into our world, it breeds unfamiliarity. It leads to, at times, levels of insecurity and even resistance. And it drives us back to the norm, what we know. Our biggest challenge in mental skills as it relates to the future of baseball and other professional sports is to continue to assist in the development of these athletes that the natural byproduct of change is a normal one, but to be more uncomfortable in time is the real key. Because the more you expose yourself to a level of discomfort, then that becomes more of the norm. Julie? Yeah, I can speak from more of a technology standpoint. Um, <coughs> in two years, we'll have headsets that are double the resolution they are today. How many, I'm sorry, how many years? Two years, 24 months. Um, we'll have 4K resolution displays. We'll have uh, update rates of 120 hertz on the headsets. And we'll have a, a field of view exceeding 120 degrees. Uh, on, in AR headsets, we'll have the first viable consumer AR headsets. Um, we will also have, in three years, um, edge computing. So edge computing and, and 5G will enable the uh, remote rendering of uh, the, the, right now we have a laptop and we have a device. Um, we're, with edge computing, you have your uh, compute on the cloud, distributed, and then <clears> on, you have a, a, a light client. So every player is going to be able to take this with them on the road and get the same experience that today they get on their laptop. Um, this is going to dramatically reduce the cost. This is going to improve the quality of that experience. So um, it will kind of open up and enable the access to, to a wider volume of players within, within any organization. So, uh, Emily, I'm going to, that's a broad question for you. Um, maybe just think, there's one thing you're particularly passionate about and what that looks like in the next five years? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, to your earlier point, so I work mostly with position players, to your earlier point, that hitting is a little bit behind, a lot behind pitchers. Um, so I think that's something we're excited about is being able to expand our, you know, technology and data resources on hitting in particular. I think that that's something that um, teams and the industry at large, you know, fan graphs, things like that, is turning its attention more to. Um, you know, the pitch characteristics have been around for 10 years, and that's something that, you know, uh, has gotten a lot of attention, but as we start moving into the hitting realm, it being kind of fundamentally a harder problem. Um, I just think that you see the industry moving that way a little bit more and, you know, having more resources to do um, analytics on that and to better understand it, both from the mental skills side, but, you know, also the mechanics, the timing. Like, there's just a lot going on on that side that I think, um, now that we have more resources to kind of address those questions, we see the industry moving more in that direction. And I, I, I believe the Dodgers have maybe the largest baseball operations staff in baseball, if not the largest, very close. I was looking at the, at the, on the web yesterday, and it's, it's pretty impressive how many people work on these issues. Yeah, we have a really good group. <laughs> uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, this one's from Tyler, and this is for anyone who cares to answer. Um, in a tech data-driven revolution, how do we avoid fitting players to a mold who appear to be much more dynamic? How do we optimize a player's unique features, biomechanics, physiology, mindset, et cetera? I, I think the simplest question to that is customization. I think that the, the athletes in today's world, uh, their, their personalities are often as big as their contracts. And you know, when you're nine years old and you've got 25,000 Instagram followers, then things like that happen. And that's, that's a, a natural byproduct of technology. Those are the things, that, the variables that we like to say that are beyond our control. Um, and I think there needs to be a baseline from a mental skills perspective of what's being taught, but that norm has been so saturated for the last 30 years. There's really nothing new. We, we, at Mindful Athlete Training, we call them modern mental skills, which is the application of traditional mental skills in a modern way. Uh, encouraging moments like attentional shift, the demands of being more mindful or being more present that's wrapped into a functional activity that's going to encourage the athletes to do. So now you can apply a mental skill while being physical. And that's the marriage that we're looking for. 
It's the relationship between mental skills and physical skills that I think back to the holistic aspect of where things are going, what the future looks like. Uh, we've had a lot of people stop in the last couple of days, even last year, which had a big reason as to why we wanted to return to Saber. What we are doing is the future. There's no doubt about that. It's really just a question of how technology, which I have no problem saying is, is beyond my pay grade because there are aspects of technology that are gonna to continue to allow me to infuse in two years what we started with in the winter meetings and what we have now. Uh, my, my two associates that are with me here today, we all kind of laughed. We've reduced our equipment by two thirds in two years of the things that we actually need to implement what we call the mobile mind gym. So we can take it now place to place and the relationship between all of this and how it impacts player development. I think it needs to be talked about more open, uh, more frequently with uh, you know, the diversity of perspective to get more creative thoughts about this topic out in the open. Emily, do you find uh, that you need customized plans for each player? Yeah, I think so, and I think that importantly too, especially from an analyst perspective, is like to remember they're human beings, right? And I think that that sometimes gets lost when you're looking at a list of player IDs. Um, but you know, being like spring training's great. You know, we have a lot of the analysts come into town. You can actually meet the coaches and the players. Um, obviously, you know, you don't want it to color the analysis, but still having that perspective and the ability to understand that. Each player is a person and a unique person, I think, does add a lot of context to the information and just kind of humanizes the entire thing as well. Well said, Emily. Lee, this one is directed to you specifically. Oh, Why boy. is, quote, without judgment, unquote, one of the elements of developing mindfulness? How does that apply to players of different cultural and educational backgrounds. It's as wide as the Grand Canyon is the answer, is because we all judge ourselves, back to Emily's point, because we're all human beings. I, I myself just this morning judged myself for just a brief nanosecond as to what degree I was thoroughly prepared for this panel discussion, because there are two people on it that I don't necessarily know, and I tend to over-prepare. So when you think about our level of preparation, think about performance, think about readiness, how often do we actually engage in judgment? We do it all day long. So to the, to the question that's being asked specifically, I think culturally it has much to do with how we're raised. Uh, we integrate a lot of uh, ACT, which is based on the clinical foundation of acceptance commitment therapy. And Dr. Megger, my biofeedback director, is an expert in that. And we assign value we, based on values of these athletes what do they really believe in? And if we can tie those values into what we're trying to teach them, then it's gonna sink in. And it decreases the likelihood because judgment as we know it as human beings, we can't necessarily stop. What we need to work on is accepting that every now and then we have a judging mind, but it too will transcend. It's not a permanent fixture. It's not a maladaptive dysfunctional coat that we need to wear it's something that we can turn over time and accept that it's just part of our psyche. It's part of us and our operation as being a human being. And this all drives back to the holistic integration of the athlete in 2019. Julian, I have a very specific question for you in a second, but Emily, I wanna ask you first, um, how do you incorporate cultural difference into what you do? Yeah, that's huge. So like just in the data team, if we wanted to communicate directly with like a Latin player, none of us speak Spanish, right? And so just practical things like that do definitely factor in. Um, I know like I've made it out to CLP in the Dominican, just like again, providing context for these players, understanding where they've come, where they come from, I think again, humanizes everything. Um, but also, you know, leveraging, you know, our coaching staff who do, you know, speak other languages, you know, not just Spanish, but, um, uh, you know, a multitude of different um, languages and nationalities that, you know, we have, um, you know, again, I think it again goes back to the point of figuring out how to communicate in a way that works for that individual. So individualizing your delivery and uh, individualizing your understanding and your context from where that player has come from um, and, you know, not intelligence at all, but just education level, right? Like, you know, you can have a, you know, 
college draft guy who you know has a technical degree versus somebody who you know doesn't even have a high school education so being able to cater your information and the delivery to you know what is not going to overwhelm that person and what's going to resonate with them so Julian I'm this this I just was thinking about this and w wondering if um, if uh, there's a learning curve with VR and if kids who grow up playing video games take to it more quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, kids who have gamed and are very receptive and, and very eager to try the system out, in contrast to maybe other forms of training, um, you know, there, there's just an intuitive and, uh, you know, a desire to, to get in the system and, and experiment and, 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 and do it. So to have that level of buy-in and commitment from a player is just, um, you know, a happy benefit of, of, of what we do. So, I, you know, there, it definitely makes it easier, but even people who necessarily haven't played VR or, you know, or maybe older players, um, if, uh, you know, it, it, VR is kind of like the Wii. Uh, you know, it's, it's something very intuitive. It maps one-to-one -to, -one to your physical movements. Um, it doesn't require learning, you know, very abstract button configurations. It's just something that somebody can very easily pick up and get into. So this question, I'm not sure how, how applicable it is for this panel, but I, I do think it opens up a, a, another area that we haven't talked about. Uh, obviously, there would be potential issues with HIPAA, but do you see health metrics being incorporated into the arbitration system one day? Um, I think I'd, I'm more interested broadly in, in, in uh, a question, for example, Lee, maybe you could speak to this. Um, would mindfulness training or, or holistic training uh, maybe help a player be a little more open when he is on the verge of uh, overtraining or, or suffering an injury. There's been a long tradition of, of, of pitchers specifically not telling anyone when their elbow hurts. Well, it's reducing the likelihood of burnout for sure because it's bringing yourself to, into a higher level of awareness of how mind and body are synchronizing, how well that they're working. Uh, and it's, the, the brain is, we, 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 uh, what we like to say is, you know, the, the brain is a, a muscle that we cross-train like anything else. If you think about the types of training models that go on today, constantly looking for that 1% difference, all of this is predicated on brain function. Every single aspect of it. Uh, we've, we've, we've heard directors of player development saying that the most important thing, bottom line, is strength training. Well, what do you think coordinates and manages the, the what's the supercomputer that drives all of that synchronization? It's brain function. And the relationship between mind and body, when you talk about holistic training, is something that's becoming more and more of the norm as it relates to training philosophies. Emily, I apologize for the, this impossible question, but on the same lines, how do you balance um, in the front office uh, a pitcher perhaps adding two miles an hour to his fastball but increasing his injury risk by 20%? Yeah, it's totally an impossible question, right? But I think that that does get at kind of a, a broader issue of balancing health with performance, just because in general there are often trade-offs with those two things. Um, and so, you know, the, the cold analytical answer is you figure out what the expected value of those, you know, two things are, right? But I think, again, trying to separate, at least for on, on, our, on my part with the particular group I work with, trying to separate us a little bit from the the trade decisions and the cut decisions and a little bit more towards, you know, maybe a focus on development. You know, I can't necessarily speak to, you know, the, the broader question, but I think that that's definitely something that we factor in and that, you know, generally would want to defer to the human being, right? So um, potentially, you know, you want to do what's best for that player's career without jeopardizing that player. And so, you know, there might not be a rigorous, like, dollars and cents answer to that, but it being something that we do have to factor in in the decisions that we make. Julian, is, is, does VR allow training uh, that, that, that uh, leads to a lower injury risk? It does. Um, it, you know, it's just in the theme of breaking out the perceptual cognitive from the perceptual motor, motor skills, um, you know, being able to take those classroom exercises and minimize repetitive stress, and see that, you know, see that picture 
a hundred times within the simulation across thousands of pitches without straining yourself as a player. Um, that's definitely a, a key benefit. Um, and then even in, uh, you know, in a batting simulation scenario, not feeling the impact or the shock of um, you know, the acoustics of, of vibrations when you get a bad hit, you can just take those swings over and over as, as you would you know, hitting off a tee um, without that repetitive stress and fatigue. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here and thank this audience for making me smarter. I'd be, I'd be in the panel. <laughs> <laughs>